Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second uh, entry in our spring webinar series focusing on the ACR, ACRL framework for information literacy in higher education. Today starts our first session where we start looking at the individual frames that make up the ACRL framework. I do want to uh, welcome you all today. Um, for everyone who is attending this session live, you will receive um, a recording once it is available, hopefully this afternoon, along with a certificate for your attendance today. I also want to mention that I am going to be jumping back and forth in between a few screens to get some links and things, so please bear with me as I do that. But hopefully everything goes smoothly and my internet holds out. So again, thank you for attending today. And we will have time at the end for questions, both recorded and unrecorded, but please feel free at any time to pop your questions in the chat. I have set it up so I can see them or just unmute yourself and go ahead and add any uh, you know, comments or questions or suggestions that you have. We'd like to think of this as a collaborative environment. So today we're gonna to focus on the frame information creation as a process. And to start, I would, like I said, jumping in between screens. I would like to share the link for this frame from the ACRL website. Uh, that link takes you directly to the frame itself where you can read the entire text of it. Today, I'm gonna cover the main aspects of the frame and not the frame in its entirety, just to give you an idea of what it's like to wrestle with these frames. Uh, the UDC librarians a couple summers ago spent one Friday uh, through the summer going over each frame individually, and we would sometimes be at it for two to three hours. And today we've only allowed about 30 to 45 minutes. So that gives you an idea of how much information there is to process. So to get started for information creation as a process, the main idea is that information in any format is produced to convey a message and is shared via selected delivery mode. That iterative process of researching, creating, revising, and dis and dissemination of information vary, and the resulting product reflects those differences. Essentially, what this frame is trying to get at is that information is more than the stuff. It's more than the content. It's more than the format. There is the importance of the process of that creation, and that process necessarily informs both the value we place on that information and its ultimate use. And so these are some things to keep in mind when we look at this frame, that it's trying to focus more on the process behind the creation of the information, how it is used, and the value of it, as opposed to the content itself. And while content is important, an, infor an information literate learner understands that the process has a profound impact on what that information says, how it is used, and the inherent biases and privileges behind it. And so in this frame, the skills it is trying to get at are what are the pros and cons of those various processes? So an information literate person would understand the difference in the process between the creation of a peer reviewed article, the creation of a blog or creation of the video. All three of those sources could be saying the same thing, but how that information is created and presented impacts how we perceive it. And an information person, information literate person also understands, will this work for my need, i.e. is it the right kind of information? Just because something is out there and is, you know, factually correct doesn't necessarily make it right for that individual person's need. And so that's why the process of creating this information is important. We're always telling our students, you need to use peer reviewed sources over other sources. And we're, right there, we're telling them the process behind the creation of that information is important. And this is why sometimes perception matters, looks matter. You know, essentially we pay more for what good packaging is. You know, when you're going shopping at the grocery store, you know, do you want the name brand cereals? You know, do you want the Fruit Loops or you don't, do you want the Fruity O's? It depends on what you're using it for. They could inherently be the same thing. And that's pretty funny. A lot of um, store branded products are the exact same thing as the name brand, but we pay for the packaging. And this is the same thing in information creation. The content Content may be the same, but how we process it, how we make it, how we package it does necessarily inform the inherent value we put behind it. And this is also related to the bias of who is making the information. It says a lot about what we value and why. You know, in academic literature, we often put privilege on those peer-reviewed articles or on scholars in the field. And 
that's not a bad thing, but it doesn't form how we use something because someone who doesn't have that degree could be just as well informed as that scholar, but because they don't have that PhD or they don't work at that institution, it necessarily biases us against that information. And so this is why it's important when we're working with our students, you know, to show them, you know, the process behind why something is created, because that creates the bias um, that we may necessarily have for that. And we'll cover that more, that authority aspect in one of our later sessions. And so we also want to teach our students, um, you know, and ourselves accepting the ambiguity and the changing nature of the information creation and dispersion. Like years ago, we never would have thought of Twitter as the go-to place to get information and news. One, it didn't exist. And two, the people on it, you know, once it was created, you didn't really think much of them. But now news stories break every day on Twitter. And, you know, I'm thinking of past political figures who put, you know, groundbreaking news on Twitter before they put it anywhere else in a platform that we used to consider trustworthy, like, you know, the White House uh, briefing room. And so there are learning outcomes from this frame. Um, that this frame drives towards. And that's knowing the pro, you know, that the process of how information is created will help students critically evaluate that information more successfully. So when we're teaching our students about these resources, we don't just wanna teach them about the content. And while the content is important, we wanna teach them about the process of how that piece of information was created because it'll help them more critically evaluate that resource, you know, down to its core, how it is written, how it is presented, who did it? It'll teach them to look at the biases. It will teach them to look at, you know, where is this coming from and things like that. It also helps our students to learn that information is not static. And again, this helps students evaluate it no matter how it is made, where it is found, or what it looks like. Oftentimes we tend to bias information because it's based on a certain platform. We elevate, you know, those peer reviewed articles. And sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's not. And so what this frame is trying to do is it's being neutral. It's trying to teach students that it's the process that is important. It is neutral about the platform. You can apply this skill to any sort of article or you know, video. It's what's the process behind it that we are evaluating, not necessarily the platform itself. And so when it comes to teaching these skills in the classroom, there are a lot of things we can do with our students. Um, a good and easy one that you can do is, you know, looking at the different formats and then looking at the process behind it. I like to call this the format breakdown. And so you can take a tweet, you can take a peer reviewed article and you can take a video. And then you ask your students, what are the steps, the step-by-step -step process that goes into each of those platform from idea to research, to editing, to review, you know, the length, the timeline, the ease of creating it you know these are all things you can look at and then we can look at why and how we would use those particular ideas and then you can contrast and compare and what's good about this is it forces students to look at you know you can pick the same topic for all of these but it forces the students to look at the process of how that information product came to be you know who made it? How did they make it? How fast did it take them? Was there an editing process? You know, did a publisher look at it? These things, you know, was it freely created? Did a lot of deep research go into it? And when you look at that process, it's forcing the students to think critically about the process and the piece of information before them. And related to this, in one moment, I am going to jump and get a link. There is another resource called Oh My God Lattery from Project Cora. And Project Cora will be listed later in our resources simply because it is such a wonderful tool providing these classroom and assignment lessons. And what Oh My God Laterally does is it looks at objective media gathering and lateral reading. So this is sort of the same idea. It's a hands-on activity where students contrast and compare a news story on a current event or a topic, and then they do lateral reading across different levels. So you can look at a resource from a conservative outlet, from an, un, you know, a top quote unquote unbiased outlet and the liberal outlet and it forces them to look at what is the process that went into creating this piece of information for this source because the results of this is going to be different depending on you know the lean of that media organization and if you would like to use this lesson in your classroom we would be help, happy to help you find uh, you know individual news stories that fit uh, the criteria you want, there's a great media bias chart we would be happy to share so you can see, you know, those different biases that come. So that shows the students how things are created 
you know, it's the same news story, but the spin is put on it differently because of who's creating it, how they're creating it, and where they're creating it for. Another resource uh, you can do, and this comes out of my colleague, Kathy, mostly, um, is our what makes a source good? And this came up um, because we often tell students you can only use quote unquote good sources over the bad sources. But what makes a source good? What is it you know, that tells you this is a good resource to use? And so in this activity, you're forcing students to think about, okay, well, why are we deeming that resource good? Why is that more reliable than another one? And so how we like to do this in the classroom is through collective brainstorming. So you give students a resource or two, and then you have them brainstorm the ideas and they look at it and evaluate the source using a list of criteria. You know, is it a scholarly article, an op-ed and news article? And then they tell you what makes it good? What are their criteria for it? And you can even do this with a tweet. You can do this with a video. You can really do this what, with whatever you want but it forces the discussion and it moves beyond that crap test method. It more fully engages the students in the process and it helps students draw upon their existing knowledge about information quality and it encourages reflection and nuanced perspectives on how you can see that resource being good over other resources. And it also shows students that good is kind of a gray area. What is good for one you know, assignment or one information need is going to be different for another one. You know, if you're doing an article on social media, yeah, tweets will be good for that. But if you're doing another thing like deep scientific research, tweets might not necessarily be good for that. And so that's why it is useful to have students do this collective brainstorming because they're going to share these ideas among one another and they're going to draw upon, you know, their own knowledge. And it, it more engages our students because they, they start to recognize, oh, I already have these skills to determine what is good or not, but then it first forces them to go a little bit further to draw upon that deeper well of knowledge. And then related to that, we have, you know, a look where we can compare popularly, popular, scholarly, and reliable. And so these are different um, categories of resources, and I just dropped in our um, LibGuide that looks at this. And popular resources, you know, things like Time Magazine and things like that, you know, Sports Illustrated, Scholarly, or, you know, what we use every day in our work, uh, you know, those medical journals from Elsevier and those big highfalutin academic publishers. And then reliable are those gray resources. It's actually called gray literature. So things, company reports or uh, things that come out of think tanks. Um, and so these are the three categories. And what's fun with this assignment is you can bring in the actual, you know, tangible resources for your students to engage with. So if you want to use this in the classroom, what you can do is you can bring in a Time magazine, you can bring in a deep scholarly article, and then you can bring in a great resource and actually let your students handle those materials so that they can flip through and see, oh, where's the publication information? Are there advertisements? You know, they can see more about the actual physical resource when they're working with it. And this also works, you know, for tweets and videos and things like that. But what's fun about this one is getting that hands-on tangible experience. Some of our learners who like to get their hands into things connect better with resources that way. So before I move on, would we like to have any discussion on this? Uh, have you tried this in your classroom? I'd love to hear about that. Um, maybe not using exactly your methodology, but we do talk about, um, you know, and, and, and we do ask questions, you know, you know, what is authentic, um, what can be relied upon. Um, but even that's a, you know, even that's a question. I was looking at something recently um, about the history of slave ships and how much um, this work, I mean, we're talking about 20, no, more than that, more like four, 40 years of, of research. Um, you have historians, um, you have also divers um, who put together or piece together um, a much more 
complete story or at least history of what happened to my ancestors um, being carried you know, across the seas. Um, a lot of those ships didn't make it. Um, a lot of them ended up at the bottom of the ocean. But here lies the question, you know, how much can you rely on the word of those who are the, or who were the slave traders or who profited from, um, you know, um, human trafficking, so to speak. So when we talk about authentic, you know, what is authentic, what is, you know, what is reliable, that itself is a question. Right now we're, you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with that question, even when it comes to publications that come from universities um, that may have had some biases in what gets published, who gets to publish, who gets to be heard, and who doesn't get to be heard. Um, remember, at one point in time, if you were Black or African American, you were not going to have access to mainstream um, journals that were quote unquote um, reliable, quote unquote peer reviewed. In other words, who were the peers? And in other words, if you're not publishing in a journal or publishing um, through um, a a university press where the quote unquote peers were, you know, who sat on, who, who had the, who were able to make decisions as to what's being published. If the, if those who call themselves the peers, if they are all, or if they're majority white, male, um, upper class coming from research one universities, um, it made it very difficult for those of us who didn't fit those categories. That's why CLA um, came about, College um, Language Association, because at one point in time, MLA was actually quite hostile. So therein lies some questions. Um, is it better? Some people might say slightly, some people might say it hasn't really changed. You're getting sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> it's okay. Go, go, go. Well, you're getting at a you know, one thing about the ACRL framework is that a lot of these frames overlap, and this one in particular overlaps quite a bit with authority and you know who we determine is an authority. And what the frame and this one in particular is trying to get at is it's forcing us to question, you know, those long held biases. Pete put in the comments, also so important to remember who has been excluded from the creation, pro historically excluded from the creation process. And that is so true. You know, minoritized researchers have often been excluded not only from the creation process, but the funding. So they can't even get off the ground. And when they do get off the ground, their voices tend to be far more marginalized simply for who they are historically. And yes, you know, that dead white guys dominate <laughs> academia and, you know, the history of publishing and all that. And these are all things we need to keep in mind. And this gets at that, you know, when we're looking at the information creation as a process, we're driving our students and we're driving our learners to look at, you know, who is making this? Why are they making it? Um, and forcing them to look at what are the biases inherent in that? Um, because the process is important. You know, we often, you know, tell people it's got to be this peer reviewed article, but that might not necessarily be the best process for the information we actually need. Um, and so you make a great point there that it is important to, you know, check how we've always done things and thought, okay, well, who's, whose voice is missing from this and why? And do we need to change the process of how that is created? So I noticed we had a few more people join us today. I just wanna jump in and say, if at any point you'd like to leave a comment, please do so in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself at any time. I do not mind being interrupted. So thank you, Dr. Turpin. Thank I, you for bringing up the topic. 
Oh, hi, Megan. I just, this is Glenn. Uh, I just wanted to mention, since I'm going to be doing the next uh, uh, one of these webinars, the next frame we're talking about actually is going to be, uh, the, the full title is Authority is Constructed and Contextual. And we're going to be talking all about what Dr. Turpin just, just mentioned. Um, so that's a like, great little like sneak peek of what we're going to be talking about next uh, in two weeks. Thanks, Glenn. Always happy to see us plug our own stuff. <laughs> um, so moving on, you know, we do our, you know, classroom teaching, but then we can also drive these points home in assignments where we can have students wrestle with these ideas, you know, either, either as individuals or as a group. And one idea you can have your students do is a why, how, who assignment. And this is basically you give them something to read, um, an article, a tweet, whatever it is, you give them something to review. But what they're looking at is not the content itself, but how the content was created. What was the process that went into creating that? You know, how did the author come up or the creator, uh, if you're doing media, how they come up with their idea? How was it edited? What's the timeline for how it is? And you have them do this reflection paper on how this information came about how it is intended to be used, how it might actually be used, and then you know, what are the biases and the privileges in that? So they're looking at the process of this information creation. And I'm seeing a hand up. Yes, please go. <laughs> okay, so real quick, because I wasn't trying to interrupt you. Oh. <laughs> I would love for, I would love for you to, um, to do, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to visit not just my 210 class, but my four, uh, my 470 writing for the web, because this is actually something that is, you know, that's kind of showing up. It's not only in, in academia, but it's showing up in popular culture. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not looking to, if you're, if you're not careful ab uh, about it, you might end up in court as Tasha Kay just recently learned. Yeah, <laughs> um, I would be happy to do that. Uh, shoot me an email and we can start coordinating that. Um, you know, my one of my undergraduate's degrees is in media studies. So I've, I've done a lot of, you know, working with our media classes on, the, you know, these very issues. Um, so with why, how, whom, essentially you're telling students, you know, ignore the content, but talk about how it was made. And so, you know, this is a great reflective paper, you know, three, five pages at most, where you're essentially asking the student, how did this come to be from start to finish? What are the problems with that? What are the pros and cons? You know, and it's a nice way to get them looking at how information is created as a process and then self-reflect on how they create information as well. And that drives right into our next one, which is asking the students, how do you create information? Get the students talking about how they created one piece of information. And this doesn't necessarily need to be academic. It doesn't need to be a paper they've written for a class or something. You can focus on, okay, you wrote an email. Well, why did you write that email? What was the process that went into it? What was your purpose? Um, and so it shows students, one, that the power they have as information creators. A lot of our students come in thinking, you know, they're not the ones who create Inform information to share. And really, they are. They are a part of this information world. They create information on all different levels in all different places. And this shows them that they are actively doing this. And it gives them, it empowers them to see how they can create information and use it in different ways. And so, again, this is another reflective paper. Um, or, you know, having them do a tweet stream or something like that, where it just shows how they create information and why. Um, and do they think they were successful? Why or why not? It gets them to critically evaluate things. And rolling into our last uh, recommendation here under assignments, there's another one where you can have them, you know, communicate a message and basically get students to share how they would craft a, a specific message based on how they are using it. And so this is getting them to compare and contrast. So you have your students say, hey, you want them to say X, thing, whatever that subject is, and then have them write it in such a way that they're trying to persuade someone, and then have them write it in such a way that it's propaganda, and then have them write it in such a way that they're trying to win an argument, and then have them write it in such a way that they're being just informative, you know, facts only. And you can come up with other ways students can use information, but this goes to show them that how they create information 
And the goal of what they want to do with that necessarily impacts the process and then how that information is developed. And so this is just a fun little assignment that they can do either individually or in groups. And it shows them that the purpose of the information informs the process. Um, and so it just gets them to engage with it on a, a bit more. Um, and so before I move on, I'd love to hear uh, from anyone if they've done something like this in their classroom or, if, you know, they like one of these ideas, we'd just love to hear more about that. I really don't want to be the only person. Uh, <laughs> there's other faculty in here, but I will say that the ideas that you have um, presented, I love these ideas and um, any, um, you know, anything you got paper, paper trail why, uh, wise or, or um, PowerPoint, anything, um, you know, and of course this recording, I look forward to this. Um, but yeah, I, I, would, I would love to be able to, um, to enhance what I already do and to try, um, you know, this particular angle. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and I will be sharing both the recording and these slides with the notes if I can get my <laughs> PowerPoint to cooperate afterwards. Um, some of these ideas are just, you know, things we do. We don't necessarily have a paper trail, but others have come out of what I'm going to get to on our resource slide next, the ACRL Sandbox and Project Core, where there are written out, you know, projects and instructions that you can use. And actually, I'll just jump over to that slide right now. Um, so so there we go. So these are our resources. I'm also going to go ahead and drop the links to both of these in the chat. Um, and so now, you know, because we intend this to be a conversation, I'd like to hear more about, um, you know, how you look at information creation in your classroom. Um, is this something you've done? Is this something you'd like to try to do? Um, just love to hear more about that, you know, when it comes to information creation being a process, is this something you've touched upon in your classroom? Or is this you know, something you would like to do? Um. <laughs> okay, because I'm getting this, folks, folks, are, folks are not um, are a little shy. Um, you know, and I'm looking at what, what, um, what Pete is saying, if you, um, in your unit, when and how do you teach about the process of sharing information within a discipline? You know, that's interesting. Um, I actually think we do a lot of that um, in our read and meet. Um, you all have heard about that, um, that, that what, what we're doing in humanities. Um, and in particular, it started in English with me, um, with Helene, um, Ada, Parajita, um, and, and, and other folk, um, of, you know, and that question of, well, how do, you, how do you approach that? I can tell you what I do, but I'm a person who spends a lot of time online. And so, and I'm also familiar with um, something called digital humanities. What do we call it? Content creation, mm -hmm. right? creating content. And that's not just in digital humanities, that's just folks who do podcasts, um, folks um, who are on YouTube, folks who have blogs, um, folks who um, do other things on, you know, online, including um, social media, we call it creating content. But it also depends on what capacity you happen to be sitting in. For some people, creating content it's simply about talking about what's going on in their lives, right? Um, and they'll provide photographs, they'll provide brief videos, yada, yada, yada. Other people like to create content by using other, um, other folks' entries. I, I sometimes do that, where you look at what has been posted on Twitter, Instagram, and believe it or not, You've got a lot of academics who start posting information, posting, um, you know, or, or even writing essays um, on Twitter, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Is that, is that 
publishing in a in a um, you know in an academic sense? No. Is it creating content that may end up in someone's peer-reviewed journal article or um, peer-reviewed um, text? Yes. And I'm one of the people who's who, who's done it actually. And that is being able to, to, and it goes back to the earlier practice, where does it come from? And so if you're teaching students um, and you're asking students um, to, um, to look for information, of course, the first place that we want them to start is of course our, li you know, our library, right? Or other people's libraries, but also be aware that you have other universities that um, universities who create content, you have other professors who create content. And yes, you do have some professors who publish their lectures, um, interviews, um, and social media sites such as YouTube, the late bell hooks, God rest mm -hmm. her soul, um, was someone who used um, YouTube. And so as a result, um, in addition to my students reading her texts, I'm also introducing them to her work, her words, her way of communicating and connecting by having them watch um, YouTube videos that have um, been published by other universities. I don't know if that fits. It does. And I think you actually, you get at a good point that, you know, there's been this history of gatekeeping when it comes to information, that if it didn't go through the peer review process, that if it didn't go through, you know, these universities or these, you know, academic publishers, that it wasn't good enough. And we know that's not true, um, you know, or we're, you know, I guess the white world is coming to admit that that is not true. In fact, I want to say that some of the best academic writing and analysis I've seen these days are coming out of Substack newsletters. And those don't go through a traditional peer review process, but many of them, they cite their sources, they have editors, they have, you know, um, you know, they have it go through a, a consortium of people they work with to be like, am I on the right track here? Am I going crazy? So there is an editing process to a Substack newsletter that's not formal peer review, but it's like peer review in many ways. And then when you see the comments on those posts happening, and that's not traditional. And that's a different process for how information is created and shared and used by the people who read it. And so, yes, I think you're getting at the good point, you know, introducing your students, not just to Bell Hooks as writing, but her videos, you know, different information, or, you know, could be the same information depending on, you know, what it's covering, but the different context and how it's created, you know, it gives a fuller, richer idea of the topic under discussion. Um, you know, so, it is interesting, some of those, the informal work of what we do as academics necessarily informs, you know, what we work on to get published. Those internal, you know, in the English department, I know you all have the, those great work, um, what the English major needs to know meetings. Those are phenomenal and the work that could evolve out of that. And that's not formal per se, but it later informs how things are, you know, formally published. And all of this is part of the process of information creation that if we don't think critically about it, we don't necessarily see the conversation that is going on um, between people that is making our, you know, the information world and landscape richer. Thank you. Thank you for thank you yeah. for rounding that uh, for rounding that out. Yeah. I, you know, I'd like to hear from some other folk. Yeah. Uh, it's not just English dealing with this. Yeah, I'm now thinking at the library, we might need to host just some informal, you know, faculty get together where we just talk about what's going on, you know, tell us what you're working on and, you know, develop those cross departmental relationships. Cause that's, that's the that's interesting the part, working with others. hard to do now too. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. I, well, I mean, it's it's harder to have those informal connections with the pandemic than it was before. Yeah. But I mean. Well, it, it's interesting. It's it, uh, Pete. I guess. Yeah. Um, it's 
it's interesting. On one hand, I, you know, I agree with you that it is, it, it presents um, uh, uh, some questions as to, well, who's going to show up for what? And mm -hmm. I've actually seen that happen just even with face-to-face -face meetings. And so sometimes I think using, um, using online sources, using, um, you know, using Blackboard, um, mm -hmm. that's what we use for Read and Me, um, or using something like, like Zoom. But of course, there are the politics of that. It, mm -hmm. it, and it depends on what kind of meeting are you looking for? I've seen people use w both WebEx and Zoom and nobody gets to show their face, nobody gets to speak. And all mm -hmm. you get to do is just maybe use the chat function Right. And whoever happens to be hosting, that's the person um, who gets to decide, who gets to be heard, who gets to be seen. And hmm. therein lies some other politics with that. And just yeah. plain old, you know, uh, you know, plain old, you know, who's a buddy, who's, who's not a buddy. On the other hand, if you had, you know, something, you know, like the library or something, you know, like... Um, you know, our other, you know, groups, you know, that do, um, that do welcome um, people to just kind of come and share and relax. You know, you, you don't have to, you don't have to dress up in a suit. You can just be who you are and just, you know, just casually talk and share. That's the kind of environment where you might actually see people's, you know, share examples within reason, um, you know, in being considerate of our students, we don't want to, you know, um, I, like to, I like to make sure that my students' identities are not, you know, are not included just out of, you know, out of consideration, but general ideas and whatnot, and just sharing difficulties, sharing successes, mm -hmm. whatnot, assessment tools and whatnot. There are many different ways and that can, of course, open doors for people to work together across, um, you know, areas of study. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of room for those interactions. That's it's difficult to moderate nowadays. Um, and the, the things you said about politics and power really matter there. Um, I think that goes to like the, the framework as a whole in a lot of ways. Um, the the information creation one, it's you can lead a whole conversation about what does it mean to teach a student the process of getting ready for a conference presentation, for example, um, or how to create a YouTube video. Um, I think that's where you get into the interesting pieces in this specific theme. Um, the, you know, how do you teach the information creation of X or Y? Um, and it, it's really different. It's a whole set of skills, like to, to make a video story as opposed to writing a paper. Yes. I think that's neat. Yes. It changes what you can do with it too. Right. And that's actually something that I do teach, um, mm -hmm. not just in my writing for the web course, but uh, um, in at least some of the upper level, um, you know, writing courses, um, encouraging students to look to those digital tools and being mindful of the fact that whether you are publishing something on YouTube or some other service um, or, you know, i.e. a podcast, a webcast, um, or you are writing a paper, you're using, um, you know, you're using Word and you're submitting it, you know, to Blackboard, you still have to provide your sources. You still have to respect other people's work and you still um, have to abide by those basic rules, you know, rules of argumentation, um, you know, making sure that um, what you are doing is, is ethical. And so those are, you know, those are great skills uh, to teach students because the reality is, is that for many people, who are going through um, 
who are going through our courses, who are completing their degrees, going on to graduate school, um, for a lot of these students, their work will be online. Their work will be digital. So that's something to think about. Anyone else like to jump in? All right, while we wait for a question or two, um, I'm just going to move to the next slide, not to end the conversation, but just to make sure I cover everything. Um, so I'm dropping into the chat our feedback form. We'd love to hear back from you today about what you liked about today's session, what you didn't like, what we can do better, what we can offer in the future. And just as a reminder, the recording should be available sometime this afternoon, and I will share it with everyone who's registered, along with the slides from today, and those who attended live will get a certificate of attendance. So if there are any you know, final questions, comments, conversation points, we love hearing from the faculty because this better informs what we do at the library and how we teach <laughs> um, the students at the university and things like that. You know, We get invited to some classes, but not all. So it's great to hear what you're doing in your classroom so that we can reinforce those lessons or that we can build upon them. Can I just say thank you? Of okay. course, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Very much. Uh uh, this is Arlene King Beer. I just wanted to make sure that um, you've been asked to visit our freshman orientation classes this semester. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I love what you, um, I love what you had to say. Uh, thanks, Pete. Um, and looking forward to seeing, um, to being in, in, um, in your session, Glenn. Thank you very much. Um, and you know, thank you for, for doing this uh, particular um, series. Um, and so this is number two, and I'm and I'm loving it. Yeah, your your homework is to bring a friend. <laughs> uh, so, and 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 that is that is absolutely that is ab absolutely uh, absolutely something that I will try to do. All right. <laughs> So yes, because we do have our upcoming sessions. I'm gonna, again, drop those, uh, the link to register for that into the chat. If you'd like to share it, please do. You do not have to be a UDC faculty member to attend these. These are free and open to everyone. It just, we happen to know all of you, which makes these conversations more fun. Um, our next session will be on February 11th at 1 p.m. Again, that is a Friday and it is covering authority is constructed and contextual, which overlaps quite nicely with information creation as a process. Are there any final shots, thoughts to share while we are recording? Just to mention that February 11th is the day of the Faculty Senate Conference. So some of us will not be able to be there, but we do, we'll, we will have access to the recording. So thank yes. you. Yes, unfortunately, we, we had set these dates out before the Faculty Senate uh, set that meeting date, but we understand um, we, even if no one can attend, we will go ahead and record the event anyway. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.